uh, this is Nadine Tansal, and I have with me today Sean Casey. Um, Sean is the Pacific Health Cluster Coordinator for the World Health Organization, and um, Sean has been a, a leader um, in some of the most challenging global health emergency events in the last decade, I would say. Um, to name a few, um, I know you were heavily involved in the West Africa Ebola outbreak in uh, 2014, the Nepal earthquake in 2015, the typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, um, Haiti uh, 2016, the measles outbreak in uh, 2019, and you have what I consider um, quite the distinction of being named um, humanitarian hero of the year in, in 2015. So, you know, welcome and, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Nadine. Thanks for having me and greetings from French Polynesia. Yes, that's wonderful. I'm particularly excited that you can set this up from a distance. And um, you said you were sitting right outside the emergency room. Um, I, I'm sitting at the Emergency Operations Center here in, in Tahiti, where um, the government of French Polynesia has commandeered two buildings next to the Ministry of Health to, uh, to bring together all of the repurposed staff from across the government who are supporting the, or coordinating the, the COVID-19 response. Amazing, amazing. Hey, you know, uh, as we, we talk about, go through this little 30 minute slot or interview that we have, I thought we would start very general and broad and then get down to what I think is gonna be the more interesting things to ask you. But um, just starting very basic, you know, the, I think the average person is very familiar with terms like the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, the WHO, the World Health Organization, but they may not actually be very comfortable of what role the WHO plays in global health crises, pandemics such as uh, COVID-19. Do you want to start there and give it a sense? Sure. Well, uh, the World Health Organization uh, obviously works globally. We have six regional offices and a global headquarters in Geneva. Um, so I work in the Western Pacific region, which is he uh, headquartered in Manila in the Philippines. Um, and I work in a division that's called the Division of Pacific Technical Support, which is based in Fiji and supports the 21 countries and territories of the, of the Pacific, um, the small island developing states uh, across the Pacific Ocean. Um, the World Health Organization has a few roles in pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, we have a historical traditional role of um, technical advice and serving as the kind of global organization of reference um, for technical guidance, uh, situational analysis, risk assessment. So we, we have responsibility um, basically with the, the we're, we've been made responsible by member states. We're a member state agency. Um, so all of the member states of the world have charged us with um, understanding what's happening in the, the, the world of uh, infectious disease, non-communicable disease, environmental health, and other, and other areas, um, giving evidence-based advice uh, and, um, and providing the best available information uh, that we're able to that we're able to provide for any given situation. In recent years, we've also become much more operational. Um, so, um, you know, in in a number of responses around the world now, you'll see WHO uh, directly supporting uh, field hospitals, deploying supplies, uh, deploying staff. For example, I've been deployed to French Polynesia, so to provide technical advice and and operational coordination support. And we also serve a coordination function. So I, my title is Health Cluster Coordinator, and, and that's uh, basically WHO is the, the cluster lead agency for uh, health in any emergency. So we're responsible not just for supporting ministries of health, but also for helping to coordinate any partners, any agencies, any NGOs, uh, organizations, emergency medical teams that may deploy um, to basically ensure that we're addressing all of the needs uh, and also not duplicating efforts. Excellent. Tell me a little bit more as you sort of narrow in what your role in the Pacific is about and what specifically either as 
the World Health Organization or you as the Pacific Health Cluster Coordinator? What is your focus? Right, so for COVID-19 in particular, um, we've been working on preparedness and response since really early January. Um, the Pacific, had, like I said, has 21 countries and territories, um, most of which are uh, quite small. Um, and many of the countries that we support have many islands, which are um, difficult to reach. There are enormous logistical challenges. Um, so, you know, I'm in French Polynesia today. There's over 100 islands here. Um, and some of them can re be reached by air. Some of them can only be reached really by sea. That's the case for a number of the countries around the Pacific. Um, we have limited flight connections. Um, some of the countries are very, very small. So we work with, um, you know, Fiji, which has close to a million people uh, on the larger side and countries like Tuvalu, which has just over 10,000. Um, so in those very small countries, there are, you know, all kinds of human resource constraints, financial resource constraints. Um, and so we have been working since January to help all of the Pacific countries and ter territories to prepare as best as possible to prevent the importation um, of COVID-19, to detect it if it, if it arrives um, as quickly as possible, to isolate and manage those cases and to reduce morbidity and mortality uh, as much as possible. Um, the good news is that to date, only a small number of Pacific countries and territories actually have confirmed cases. So in the North Pacific, the Northern Mariana Islands um, and Guam, which are US territories, um, in the South Pacific, we have uh, New Caledonia, uh, Fiji, um, and French Polynesia that all have cases. Um, the, the numbers are much lower than most other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, Fiji has 17 cases as of today. Uh, French Polynesia, where I am, has 55 over a one month or so period. Um, and, and most of the other countries don't have cases, which is good news. Um, but at the same time, we still have to continue to prepare um, because, you know, for now, flights have been stopped, travel has stopped. Um, we don't know how long that can be sustained. A, a number of Pacific Island countries rely very heavily on imported goods um, and flight connections to the rest of the world just for their basic supply chain. So um, we'll continue to prepare, uh, reinforcing surveillance, uh, reinforcing case management. You know, some Pacific countries have only um, one or two ICU beds that, that normally function, so, uh, and very limited hospital space. So we're, we're working on all of these fronts, um, and we have staff deployed over the last few months to a number of countries providing training on infection prevention and control. We've dispatched personal protective equipment to almost every Pacific country, um, and we're now working on trying to get test capability, testing capability to all of the Pacific countries and territories. Right now, only a small number can actually perform tests locally, um, which for sure will hinder their ability to detect and, and manage cases quickly. So it's across the whole spectrum. And, um, and at the same time that we're focusing on COVID, we're trying not to forget all of the other health needs that, that, that don't go away. Um, so the Pacific has uh, a huge challenge with non-communicable disease. Um, you know, women still have babies to deliver, kids still get sick. Um, the regular drug supply has to, has to still be there. And the supply chains are, are um, interrupted. So um, at the same time, we're you know, trying to keep an eye on the rest of the health system and make sure that ministries of health are able to meet all of the needs of the population to be uh, as healthy as possible. You know, you made me think of so many questions. The first is when we think of, in particular, COVID-19, we think of uh, China when it became uh, just a, a little seedling of a concern and then when it became a larger issue. What triggered your team to be deployed in the Pacific specifically for COVID-19? How large is your team? And mm -hmm. how, how, is, how does the World Health Organization either decide or layer what it does up against the departments of health or the ministries of health, depending on you know what it's called in the individual country. Right. Um, how do you balance that and how do you craft yourself specifically for that country or for that area? So that's about three or four 
questions. That's a few questions. Our, our, our team actually, um, not because we had a crystal ball, um, but because we had a measles outbreak in the Pacific last year, our team was already in existence before our emergency response team, our incident management team was already functioning and deploying around the Pacific before COVID even was identified. Um, so we actually had an incident management team that we pivoted um, that included repurposed staff from across a, a number of departments in our in our offices, but also um, additional consultants that were brought on board. Um, so, um, you know, we were already working on measles in Samoa where uh, you and I met and uh, in on measles preparedness in a number of other countries. So in January, I was deployed to French, uh, to sorry, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia. We had staff deployed to the Northern Mariana Islands. And, and at a certain stage in January, um, we started kind of switching from the focus, or not switching completely, but including COVID-19 in those discussions. And, and from, I would say, late January, we really started doing dedicated COVID deployments uh, around the Pacific. And, and we deployed staff, I think, to almost every country and territory at some stage between uh, late January and, and late March, um, right. providing training, providing planning support, um, and um, just advising. So I'm probably going to forget some of the questions that you asked, but I think we take some of our cues from, uh, we take, you know, we respond to requests. So right. we, um, we have a, an ongoing discussion, an ongoing dialogue with all of the Pacific Ministries of Health and um, with the Ministries of Health across the region. Actually, there's a meeting right now that's happening every week with the Regional Director of WHO, all of our Pacific offices and the Pacific Ministries of Health with the ministers and the, the directors of health. So we have an ongoing dialogue about the situation in which the ministries and departments of health can ask questions and express some of their needs. We also mm -hmm. have you know, lots of bilateral discussions. At the same time, in the in the COVID context, we've done some pushing of um, advice and materials just because um, not everybody may be fully conscious of what they need. I mean, I think this is a, this is a new virus and I, I think all of us are still not exactly sure what we need to be able to respond effectively. It's a, it's a learning process day by day. And um, it's, so. beyond, it's beyond the usual capacity of most of these in eight teams or uh, departments of health to be managing a pandemic, would you say? Oh, sure. I, I don't think there's a country in the world that was that was completely prepared to deal with this. And I think every every country and every health department and ministry of health has had to reallocate resources and repurpose staff and um, rethink everything that they had thought about before. You know, we, we've all been working on pandemic preparedness for a very long time. Um, we've been dealing with pandemics for centuries, and in the Pacific, there's a, an acute awareness of the Spanish flu pandemic from 1918, where some countries were very badly affected and other countries weren't affected at all because of border control measures and, and, and other measures that they put into place. So pandemics are on our mind in the Pacific, um, and we, we also know that the Pacific countries are particularly vulnerable. Um, they're protected in a way by their isolation, but they're particularly vulnerable. So there, there was no illusion that any country in the Pacific is ready to deal with a pandemic, but we had done pandemic planning and uh, almost every country has a pandemic influenza plan. But this pandemic is not pandemic influenza, this is pandemic coronavirus, um, which doesn't have a vaccine as influenza does, or uh, you know, in, influenza vaccines are generally easier to develop. It doesn't have any therapeutics that are readily available, and we don't have a you know a prior knowledge of the dynamics of transmission and clinical evolution. So um, we can use some of that uh, content that was developed and some of those plans that were developed um, as a baseline and thinking about how you manage the incident, how you reorganize resources, emergency declarations if necessary. But some of the very technical content we've had to really develop as we go along. So since January, WHO has been releasing um, technical guidance and updating it constantly, um, which you know is a massive undertaking to develop and it's also a ma massive undertaking to digest. And so when I, when I mentioned before that the Pacific countries have limited human resources, it's particularly important that we as WHO in the Pacific can help to process some of that content and translate it for the local context and also um, filter what's really needed at, at what time and, and what can maybe be used later or what can be used differently. You know, you made me think of something. 
in the context of Hawaii, because the, the people in Hawaii view themselves culturally and very much part of the Pacific Basin. And um, at first, when you were discussing this, I thought, yes, this is in the context of Hawaii, but is that true? Does your team view Hawaii as part of the United States? And are the strategy or the relationship that the World Health Organization has with us is from the lens of the United States under the CDC? Or are we part of that strategy for the Pacific region as a whole? So the United States is a member state um, of WHO in the Western Pacific region because um, we have three US flag territories in the region. So our Pacific office doesn't directly cover Hawaii from a technical support, support perspective, but we do support American Samoa, uh, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Having said that, um, you know, we, uh, we met through a collaboration with Hawaii in support of the Pacific, and, and I think it's an area where um, we'd like to see more development. I think that Hawaii is um, inextricably linked to the rest of the Pacific through flights, through culture, through language, and, and uh, through history. And um, there's incredible resources that are available there, that, which we saw deployed for the Samoa measles response in uh, November and December of last year. Um, at the same time, I think our focus on technical support um, is really across the, the, the breadth of the Pacific, but there are always some countries that um, might require uh, more support than others. Um, and Hawaii has, you know, an incredible level of resources, particularly compared to most of the rest of the Pacific. So um, we're always happy to engage with Hawaii, um, yeah. but it's, it's, it's not uh, a territory that's, you know, a state that's, that's in our typical remit as the Western Pacific region. No, I, I, I know exactly what you're referring to. We've had discussions on this. As a result, the Hawaii Health Corps was created and um, a lot of thoughts of what we could do both locally as well as with our island neighbors. And I don't mean our um, island neighbors within the state, but in the larger Pacific Basin. And uh, some of those conversations have come to a halt as we're all trying to deal with our regional COVID-19. But I know these conversations will continue because the excitement that was generated just in the healthcare community was palpable to say the least. You know, there's, there's an incredible level of Pacific solidarity. I mean, there, there's, like I said, there's 21 countries and territories and they're all different. Um, and they, you know, they have their own languages and their own culture, but there's an incredible level of solidarity in the Pacific. And we saw in the measles response um, uh, last year, uh, smaller countries, countries that did not have formed emergency medical teams, Kiribati, uh, the Solomon Islands, Fiji, um, with varying level of the levels of resources, financial and human, still sent support to Samoa, uh, which is one of the larger Pacific countries to help them with their measles outbreak. And we've seen that same kind of action uh, in, in past emergencies. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll see it in the future. I couldn't agree with you more. And you can see that in healthcare, you can see that in the Polynesian voyaging society, in, the, in the, their history in of itself. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, um, Sean, talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges that the WHO has been struggling with in, uh, let's just use COVID-19, because that's where we are now. It is such an incredible example, whether it's been, whether it's, its general structure is, was ready to handle this? Is it been a learning process? Are you stretching yourself in ways that you've not had before, either in professional resources, having the language or the defined type of teams that were necessary to do this? I, I, it's a very open question mm. um, and uh, to just understand what does it feel like going through this process live? Right. Well, I think, um, I, like I said before, I don't think anybody was completely prepared for COVID-19, but um, I think for WHO, we, we learn in every response. Um, so we have a systematic uh, after action review process that um, we uh, apply and we take very seriously. So we learned a massive amount through the Ebola response in West Africa, um, where I spent a year and a half. Um, we learned a huge amount through the, the, the 
Ebola response in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is ongoing, and through past pandemic experiences, um, through um, you know the SARS response, the H1N1 response. And so we're nobody's perfect. No organization is perfect. We um, you know we have our strengths and our weaknesses. But I think the systems that we have developed through those responses were well adapted to COVID. So the principles, the underlying principles, are there, and that's why you know it was in the Pacific so great that we already had an incident management team established. There, there was basically you know no blip whatsoever. We immediately pivoted that team. To work on, um, uh, and aside from having some people who were tired from uh, several months of uh, pretty intense work on measles, pivoting to the next response, I think the model is is really a good one, and it allows us to um, to act relatively quickly, to process information pretty quickly, uh, to deploy support quite quickly. A lot of the challenges that we're facing at the moment are logistical challenges um, that are really outside of our control. So um, even if we have staff who are ready to deploy, even if we have um, PPE that can that can you know in theory be shipped, we're we don't have a way to move a lot of these supplies. So we're having to get creative, um, and and that's why you know this week or next week french polynesia is going to be sending a plane to china and they're sending the plane to paris and we're we're coming up here with creative solutions and i think everybody in the world is doing that including who at the moment but i think the fundamental systems have developed over time and will continue to develop they'll continue to improve but um we yeah i i, I think um the systems that we've evolved over time are all being used and they're being used the way that they were intended to no, 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 by all means, that's an excellent answer. And this was not in any way to uh, 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 place any other than an intellectual conversation of uh, what do you think? And, you know, what are we learning live as we yeah. fly the plane that we're building at the same time? Um, well, I don't think any of us could have expected that global air travel would have come to a grinding halt. So <laughs> I, 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 I think that's something that, um, you know, raises lots of questions about um staff deployments and production of materials and stockpiles and things like that um i think um what's really encouraging in this response is seeing the level of um investment and uh financial investment and human investment and, and um political investment in finding out as much as we can sharing information as quickly as possible and acting upon it so there's never been a le level of you know, investment and effort in a vaccine, in vaccine research, therapeutics research, um, diagnostics research, in such a collaborative way, we see papers coming out every day, um, you know, just uh, rapid yeah. fire information sharing, um, which is completely overwhelming, but also um, really useful. And I think um, it's, it's enabled us to learn at a, at a click that we would not have seen uh, before in previous pandemics. And in such a collaborative way, the, the mm -hmm. speed in which we are using international papers, research, opinion pieces, and trying to incorporate them uh, on a clinical level into our procedures, protocols, and guidelines. I've never experienced anything like this before. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, I've got two really quick questions for you. One along the lines, of, and let me be very oversimplistic. You know, when you think of COVID-19, there we don't have the typical tools in which we uh, often address other illnesses. We often use the flu or the measles as an example of having a preventative um, tool or arm, which would be the vaccine. We have medications to deal with someone getting it, such as the um, uh, a Tamiflu or an antiviral medication, and um, other ways in which we can do point of care testing to be able to quickly tell uh, what is going on in our immediate population and in a reporting system. Tell me a little bit about what you think, and um, I'm gleaning not necessarily the official World Health Organization opinion. I am asking you. Um, we will not have a vaccine likely for at least another year to year and a half for very safe and logistic reasons. We, um, we are not likely to have an antiviral ready. Uh, we've, uh, you've heard everyone from politicians to singular papers discussing whether certain drug combinations or drugs that are used in other purposes might be of some help. So there's a lot of focus on having point-of-care testing. And what I mean is testing that can be 
Um, we can get results in a very short period of time, anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, and that it's cheap enough and easy enough to be in any office, clinic, or emergency room. Any, any thoughts about that and the role that the World Health Organization might play with, with that, with, our, with the, the various countries, and giving any guidelines? And I, and I know that there's no official response yet. Right. So, I mean, I think fundamentally we're going to need some combination of diagnostic capacity, uh, clinical capacity, you know, therapeutics um, or otherwise. Um, we're going to need to continue to apply non-pharmaceutical measures. And I don't think anybody has figured out what the right dose of non-pharmaceutical measures is. Um, and when I say non-pharmaceutical measures, I mean, uh, you know, social distancing, physical distancing, lockdown. Right travel restrictions and things like that, um, which are obviously showing an impact, but we don't know yet when they can be let up and not, um, and, and all of those pieces fit together. So the diagnostics are going to be absolutely useful, um, but they'll still have to be paired with some kind of uh, 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 social distancing measures, some kind of non-pharmaceutical measures. Um, We'll absolutely, hopefully, you know, we are very, very hopeful that we'll we'll have a vaccine at some stage. But until then, testing and social distancing or some kind of non-pharmaceutical measures are going to be the the, the prescribed approach. Um, so yeah, I mean, for WHO, we're investing a lot in all of these areas and trying to figure out what the best solutions are, and also recognizing that different countries and have different contexts and different needs. So um, you know, large-scale testing. Um, is definitely needed in populations that have large-scale transmission and where we don't really we really don't know who's infected and who's not and there's likely to be more social interaction in some countries like here in French Polynesia we're we're not testing everybody um, because we know that half of the cases that we've identified so far are imported so here we want to have very focused testing um, and reasonable application of social distancing measures maybe with an eye at some point for too long to not having local transmission. So right. there are some countries that are still, you know, that still don't have cases. Most of them are in the Pacific. And that's where the non-pharmaceutical interventions are absolutely key. There's other countries that have very large scale transmission and their diagnostics, whether it's point of care or some kind of rapid diagnostics are gonna be really critical for them to be, to be able to reopen. But it's not, diagnostics are not on their own the solution. Um, a vaccine, uh, at some stage might be a, a, a very, very helpful solution, uh, but it's gonna take time. So in the meantime, it's gonna be diagnostics. It's gonna be a continued focus on finding therapeutics that work. WHO has uh, is supporting a trial now that has 90 countries signed up or interested in 900 patients enrolled, looking at four different co drugs or combinations of drugs. We're gonna have to keep doing more of that. Um, yeah. we, we have to go full speed on all of these efforts. There's no, there's not gonna be one. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Do you know, um, I, I, as, you, as you're describing um, all of these things, it, it occurs to me that one of the big questions that is going to be on every politician's mind as well as government is how do we go from the social distancing many people have, you know, to stay in place where we are now to returning back to whatever degree of normal or new normal. And it, it seems to me by the way you were describing the World Health Organization's role in other endemics, pandemics, or um, uh, that this would be a very new role to be involved in turning the faucet back on and giving guidelines along those, uh, um, uh, 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 those rules or, or, or such. Comment about that. Because right. it's very, very political space right now, but I think you and I can also agree it's also a very clinic science space. Uh, 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 space. Your, your sure. Thoughts. Well, there's there's the health side of it, which is you know for us as as health authorities, we will we can say the ideal solution is that for now everybody stays at home or washes their hands or wears a mask or whatever the specific advice is that comes from the health authorities. Um, but we you know we have to take into consideration the fact that schools are closed, that parents can't work because their kids aren't at school, that, you know, in, in the US today, they just announced that I think in four weeks, 22 million people have lost their jobs. 
Um, right. The economic impact is going to be absolutely massive. So we have to strike that balance, but we can't strike it alone as health professionals um, because there's there are other dynamics at play. And, and what will really influence the direction that COVID-19 takes us is human decisions. Many, many different human decisions that are going to be made, some of which are health decisions and some of which are social and economic and political. So I think the, the, the really important thing as we go forward is having that dialogue and continuing the dialogue and continuing the debate. And there's no right answer, um, but we want to protect as many lives as possible, um, whether that you know, means um, reopening or, or keeping things closed for a while or gradual reopening. There's no formula yet. So countries that are inching out at the moment um, are doing it in a, in a kind of a trial fashion um, to try to find um, the, 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 the channel that will work best for them. And then all of the rest of us are going to have to keep watching and learning. You know, almost everything that's been done in the Pacific to keep population safe has been referencing what happened in China and what happened in Singapore and what happened in Korea and what happened in Italy. And that's influenced decisions. And I think we're going to have to keep doing that. So, we're, you know, as health authorities, we need to keep looking at what everybody else is doing and learning from it. Um, use the best available evidence and science, but also take into consideration that we can't keep everybody locked down forever and we're going to need to find additional solutions. And those solutions are likely to include diagnostics, like you said, at some stage, maybe therapeutics, lots of non-pharmaceutical interventions of different kinds, um, continuing to reinforce hygiene, good hygiene practices um, and, and physical distancing measures that maybe that are not social distancing, but physical distancing measures so we can still interact as a society and hopefully someday vaccines. But it's going to be, it's going to be a combination of those um, from a response perspective, but also from a planning perspective. Oh man, that, that is perfect. And um, it's, it's exactly what I think we want to know. We want to hear that the World Health Organization is up to. I know we're in trying times as uh, the U.S. has put a halt to some of the funding that go to the World Health Organization. But am I being too presumptuous in um, saying it's very likely that the World Health Organization is going to continue to do what it does regardless of what is going on politically. Mm. And we're laser focused. We have, I'm, we're laser focused on our mission. Um, before, before coming on with you, I was on a call with the, the entire staff of the Western Pacific region. There were 375 people in the call and um, the, the central message um, from our regional director, but from across the staff is we have a mission. And I think now is the moment for focus and solidarity. Um, we've we continue to receive very positive uh, feedback from member states and partners. Um, of course, like I said, no response is perfect, and we're all learning. Um, it's a novel disease, but we're focused right now on trying to prevent as many infections as possible, trying to make sure that uh, as few people as possible um, get infected and get ill and 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 die from COVID-19 and from everything else. So, you know, WHO's mission remains the same. It's not just COVID-19. Um, it's about advancing the health and well-being of society. And, and we're going to keep on trying to do that. Um, and, and of course, the, the decisions on funding um, may have an impact on us, but and we'll, we'll work through that. And, and, and hopefully those resources um, can be made up in other ways, um, through additional contributions or through, um, you know, working more efficiently, um, which we all wanted to do. Um, but we're we're not gonna we're not gonna let up on the work that we're doing. It's 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 absolutely continuing. Well, I can tell you, I am in awe of what the WHO does, um, of the mission, um, believe in it. I tell you, our our small interaction, if I could speak for Hawaii. Um, was nothing but positive on our brother country, brother sister country, or Polynesian uh, um, country. And um, thank you, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for being our guest today and taking time out from Papa Ete. <laughs> <laughs> and, Thanks um, so much, Nadine. I hear you're you're going to be off soon uh, to your next assignment. Uh, is what you were saying also? Well, no, I don't know. You know, I came here one month ago today for five days. Um, mm -hmm. And there are no flights out at the moment. So there's, well, there's a, there's a flight to Paris every 10 days. 
Um, Fiji is kind of in the other direction. That's where I'm normally based. So we'll see, we'll see where I end up and when. Um, but I've managed to buy some shirts in the supermarket and I'm, uh, I'm still finding baguettes and French cheese here. So I'll, I'll survive in the meantime and we'll keep focusing on the work. And um, oh, yeah, at some, at some point I'll make a move, but I'm not in a rush. That's okay. That's okay. It was so <laughs> great to see you. Thank you so much.